I would like to introduce Michael Albert as, as someone uh, who doesn't need much introduction. <laughs> Together with Robert Hainel, he has developed Pericon, uh, inspiring and encouraging a large audience to think far beyond existing social institutions. Um, and yeah, inspiring myself too, of course. So we are extremely grateful that Michael Albert is presenting Paracan in detail at this conference. So we have plenty of time uh, to go into uh, details and that we have the opportunity to discuss um, this with him directly. So thank you so much for supporting this conference in this way. And I don't want to uh, waste too much time with an introduction like this. So you have the floor. Thank you so much, Michael, that you are there. Well, thank you. Uh, I, it's very impressive what you've put together here. Uh, let me preface uh, the discussion a little bit personally, I guess, uh, and then we'll get to participatory economics. So uh, when I was the age of at least some people who are going to be here, maybe a majority of the people who are going to be here, that is when I was much younger in, uh, in the mid to late 1960s, uh, there was the uprisings of those times and the political organizing of those times and I was radicalized and uh, things moved very quickly. Uh, one could be, you know, basically apolitical going about one's life one day and within a couple of months a raving revolutionary, um, including with a considerable degree of uh, actual understanding uh, because they were in very intense times. And when we went through that, Robin and myself um, arrived at a point where we felt there's a problem. And the problem was everybody knew what the hell they were against, um, but weren't very good at expressing what they were for. And yet a lot of people, almost their first reaction was, what the hell are you for? Um, I get that you don't like capitalism. I get that you don't like poverty. I get that you don't like racism and so on. Um, but what have you got to offer instead? And at the time, initially, we felt that was unfair. You know, that uh, people living under slavery didn't have to have an alternative to slavery to be against slavery. You didn't have to have all those answers uh, to justify being against what was rotten and horrendous, like say the war in Vietnam. And that was technically true, but I think it was strategically not so wise. Um, because in fact, the answer to the question, what do you want, matters to us. Uh, I mean, a subset of those people were baiting us. A subset of those people were using the question to try and uh, prove that we didn't really know what we we're talking about and we should shut up. Uh, but another subset of those people were asking sincerely. Uh, they really wanted to know because they didn't want to um, uh, change their lives into activism and into struggle and into dissent without uh, feeling that it had some place to arrive. And so that's what I think caused Robin and I to start to focus on economic vision and, uh, you know, other people addition, additionally, more people as time went along. And I don't think that problem has changed all that much. If anything, I think it might be more intense now. Um, that is the need for vision in order to answer what do you want, in order to provide hope and positive uh, inclinations instead of just a negative response to everything we encounter, um, and in order to root our strategy. So I'm supposed to present vision today, um, five minutes from now, and uh, uh, I'm going to try and do that as best I can. <clears throat> but I would also welcome questions about, well, why the hell does it matter? Uh, you know, why does having uh, an economic or a political vision as last session or, uh, you know, a, a kinship or a gender vision or a vision bearing on culture and so on. Why does that matter? We are struggling now today. People are suffering now today. Why does this vision, um, uh, something that we should give any time to, 
given the incredible time pressures are just trying to respond to the resurgent right and to racism and to uh, the pain and the suffering that people currently endure. So questions of that sort are more than welcome also. Um, so participatory economics. Um, I think the way that we're gonna do this session, which is long, is to go for a while and then have questions, go for a while and then have questions. And I've tried to uh, break those go for a whiles into at least a, you know, a, a focused topic and then questions, another focused topic and then questions. Um, so the first focused topic is basically decisions. Uh, in an economy, decisions have to be made. And the question becomes how? Why, you know, how are decisions going to be made in a good economy? And uh, what kind of criteria or norm should we have for those decisions in a good economy? And uh, the, the issue then becomes thinking about what, what is our value or what is our norm for making decisions? And uh, the usual answer is democracy, for example, one person, one vote, or uh, uh, consensus. Some people will say consensus. I'm trying to arrange my uh, screen here. It's bobbling all over the place. Uh, consensus, some people might say, should be our guiding uh, light in, in thinking about decisions. Democracy should be our guiding light and so on. Now, I don't think any of those things, um, or one can imagine other ones, should be our guiding light. I think that the, the guide should be some kind of value or norm for how we think uh, decisions should be made. And if when I think about that, uh, I use simple examples to try and get a grip on it. And so a simple example would be, okay, so there'll be, you know, let's say roughly 100 folks here, and let's make believe that we're some kind of a gathering of 100 folks in some kind of deliberative body. And um, uh, one decision is whether or not uh, uh, we should each have on headphones or not, only one of us does, or whether or not we should be wearing blue or red shirts, or whether or not we should have a picture of our spouse on our desk. Uh, and clearly, if we think about that decision, uh, it's not a democracy decision. Everybody here shouldn't be deciding that. It's not a consensus decision. It's actually a dictatorial decision, right? Each of us should be more or less like Stalin making that decision, right? You, it, it's not the case that each of us should have to be tallying a vote of all the hundred of us to determine whether or not we should have on blue or black slots. Sometimes decisions in fact are made most sensibly by one person. Now assume instead that we're deciding on something uh, uh, that democracy applies. Uh, how long should those segments of this talk be? Um, maybe we should vote democratically on that one verse and one vote. Um, except, of course, that I'm, in fact, making that decision dictatorially true. Maybe that's not an advisable thing. But nonetheless, that's what's happening. Um, suppose uh, that the issue was whether or not, whether or not we should all unmute our screens and play music. Um, now, clearly, we shouldn't each be making that decision dictatorially. That's a decision that affects everybody. And so what starts to emerge, and imagine this was a workplace and we each had our little work area and uh, uh, one of us wants to listen to heavy metal music real loud. This is an example I like. Um, who should have a say over that? And we all know intuitively that the people who should have a say over that are the people who would hear the music and would be affected by the decision. Not somebody who's so distant or in another wing of the building who won't be affected, but all the people who would be affected. And pretty quickly, I think, uh, we come to what I at least think is a sensible uh, value for decision making, a guiding norm for decision making. And it's called self-management. Uh, that's what I call it. I don't think there's anything particularly original about it. Maybe the details, some of them are original. But the idea is that people should have decision-making say in proportion to the degree that they're affected. That that's really a goal 
for the process of deliberation and arriving at decisions uh, that treats everybody with respect and equally, and that doesn't uh, uh, deliver power to people who are unaffected, that's not reasonable, and it doesn't de decrease the power of people who are mightily affected. So it's not democracy, it's not dictatorship, it's not consensus, it's none of those things. Those things are tactics for accomplishing something uh, that is in fact principled, or so I would say, which would be self-management. So that becomes the principle, self-management. Uh, and then we have to ask, it's not an institution yet, we haven't solved any institutional problem, but if we do arrive at that, and maybe this is too quick to do so, but nonetheless, uh, if we do arrive at something like that, then the question arises, okay, how do we implement that? How do we actually have uh, self-management and what are the implications of wanting to have self-management whether we're talking about a workplace or a neighborhood for consumption of collective goods or outside of the economy whether we're talking about other dimensions of social life so one implication in the economy is immediately pretty evident we can't have owners of workplaces ownership conveys two things not one thing Everybody on the left knows that ownership conveys profits. Uh, you get profits on what you own. Okay, we're gonna to come to that later. But ownership also conveys control. And obviously if you have an owner, if we're all of a workforce, right? And uh, <laughs> Steve owns our workplace. That's Steve Shalom who gave the last talk. If he owns our workplace and he has dominion over our workplace, then we're not gonna have self-management. Right? That's just out the window. But if we want self-management, then already, first step, capitalism's gone. We can't have private owners of means of production of workplaces because that will violate self-management. And if we're serious about self-management, then we have to follow the implication seriously. That's what we're going to be doing during this whole course, trying to follow the implications of what we believe in for the institutions that we care about. So no owners. There's a second implication, um, which is, uh, uh, will prove more interesting for, I think, for most people. Not only can't you have an owner, but you can't have a group, right, who has uh, disproportionate power, who has more power, more influence over decisions than is warranted by the degree to which they're affected. If a subset of people has that, then another subset of people has less. And if we believe in self-management, we are violating it again. So this turns out to be, as we go along, a trivially simple observation, which is incredibly powerful. Uh, why is it powerful? Well, we'll see in a minute. But if we're gonna have self-management in a workplace, that means workers are gonna have uh, decision-making input that's that's in accord with, that closely corresponds to uh, the degree to which they're affected by decisions. Well, where are they going to have that input, right? Where, where, how, what, that's what leads to the idea of a workers' council. If somebody can figure out some other way, some other venue where workers can express their desires, develop their agendas, and make decisions on them in a self-managing way, Okay, maybe that could compete, but historically, it doesn't seem to. When workers begin to uh, become aroused, and especially when they take over workplaces, which has happened often in history, um, they tend to, uh, to naturally, it's, it's almost like a, a obvious, uh, to create some kind of workers' council or workers' assembly in the workplace, and it's a venue where it's possible for the workers to participate and to exert self-managing say. But you can see that the same thing is gonna be true over on the consumption side. Uh, in, in a neighborhood, if the neighborhood, it's one thing if I'm gonna consume, I live in a neighborhood. It's one thing if I'm gonna consume, uh, uh, you know, a bicycle or a, a violin or food or housing or whatever. That's one thing. Uh, it's another thing if the neighborhood is thinking about consuming a public pool for the neighborhood or a uh, uh, a collective laundry facility so that we don't all have to have washers and dryers 
or whatever else. Then those become collective decisions. And again, if we're going to have consumers self-management around those kinds of issues or around political issues, if the if this institution becomes operative in the polity also, which it certainly could. But anyway, regarding consumption, um, then we're going to have to have consumer councils. And consumer councils in my little neighborhood is one thing, but what if my county or my state is going to consume something collectively, right? So now we have to have federations of councils. It doesn't take long to begin to get some structure for what would be an alternative way to do an economy. If a county or a state is going to do some degree of consumption that is collective, then we're going to need some kind of, of federation of councils uh, to operate in that way. And going back to the production side, same thing. Our workplace has a council. But what if there are decisions that are at the industry level? Okay, so then there's some kind of federation of, of uh, workers' councils on that side. Okay. Um, so we have a, a beginning of a picture, just the beginning of a picture. Uh, most things aren't discussed. We haven't said anything about remuneration. We haven't said anything about uh, allocation, about the kinds of things that markets do. We haven't said anything about lots, but we have said um, quite firmly or strongly or whatever you wanna call it, that we like the idea of self-management. We like the idea of people having a say in decisions to the portion they're affected. We like the idea of workers' councils and consumers' councils. And that means we don't like the idea of an owner of the workplace who has dominion over it or of a group, uh, much less than the workforce or less than the workforce that has dominion over it. All right, so at this point, uh, we're going to invite somebody who's not in the room to enter the room, Margaret Thatcher. So Margaret Thatcher um, is now with us, I guess, in ghostly form. And Thatcher, you remember, said, Tina, there is no alternative. Uh, well, that was actually shorthand. I don't think Thatcher ever believed that. What she really believed is there is no better alternative. So Tinba, but I guess it didn't sound as good. Um, because of course there are alternatives, right? We, you know, there's an alternative to what we have now. Uh, we could all just starve to death, and in fact, that was Thatcher's point. Thatcher's point was any alternative to capitalism, any alternative to the system which now works, however flawed, however much damage it's doing, however much harm it's doing, any alternative to it, worse, right? So. So there's no point in thinking about an alternative because no better alternative is possible. Okay, so would she already, now maybe she, would, maybe she wouldn't start in with self-management right off, but I think she would start in, she would be horrified by the notion of self-management. Uh, she would say, some of you might be thinking this already, uh, wait a second, self-management, uh, that doesn't make any sense, self-management, uh, denies expertise. There is such a thing as expertise, and there is. There is such a thing as people um, knowing more about particular issues or, or decisions, or maybe even somebody knows more about almost everything. Um, and we can invite Chomsky into the room too. Um, the, the, the idea here is um, that this approach sort of doesn't pay sufficient attention to expertise. So what's the response to that? Well, my response to that, somebody else may respond differently, of course. Uh, my response to that is that there's nothing about self-management that in any way conflicts with paying attention to expertise. All it does is it says, if um, Oscar is an expert in chemistry and we are having a discussion about um, I don't know what paint to put on the walls. And Oscar knows something that's really of crucial importance. It says we should consult him. We should uh, 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 take into account the expertise. Only an idiot doesn't do that, right? Like Trump. Only an idiot doesn't take into account expertise. But we should not give to the expert, let's just say Oscar is the chemist. Right? We don't give um, Oscar control on grounds that he has knowledge. We don't convey more votes in the tally to him. He may get more time to present. 
That may make perfectly good sense, right? Because we need to hear and we need to know what these expert opinions are. But there's nothing about self-management that in any way says we should not pay attention to expertise. It just says expertise does not justify or warrant having, let's call it more votes, uh, more say, more influence in decisions. There arises another problem. Uh, Thatcher might not raise this, but she might. Um, but maybe, uh, maybe Fidel Castro would raise this problem. Um, there are various people who might raise this problem. They might say, all right, look, I get that. I get that self-management doesn't uh, preclude expertise, but what about expertise in making decisions? What about that? What about if um, uh, uh, Sarah is really, really good at decision-making? In fact, she's so good at decision-making, and let's say she's in our group, and she's the best decision-maker in the group. In fact, she's the best decision-maker by miles, by a long shot in this group. What about then? Certainly self-management does interfere with our having Sarah make most or all of the decisions based upon her expertise in decision-making. That's true. It does interfere with that. So the response is twofold. One is there's no such thing. That is, it is not the case assuming we are in a good society and a good economy and people are prepared and, and we have to come to that in a minute, people are prepared and confident and able, there's no such thing as somebody who is always the best decision maker or even on some, some particular range of things. That's a weak response, but it's, it's valid, I think. It would be enough for me. But there's another response, which is that Sarah is in fact not the best expert in the group about something very important. So for instance, um, so suppose I asked, who is the world's best expert at your preferences? Now I've done this in some talks and every once in a while somebody says my mother um, and that produces a problem that I don't know how to deal with when it happens. But the, the real answer of course is you are. You are the world's best expert at your preferences. And there are two parts to decision-making. One part is the deliberation and discussion and the exploration of the issues. And the other part is expressing preferences and having those preferences influence the outcome. Self-management not only respects um, uh, expertise in the sense of or already discussed, um, we, we consult the, the chemist about uh, lead paint so that we don't make a mistake and put it all over our workplace, but also in the sense of uh, tallying preferences. We give people, the world's best experts, uh, the, the option or the right or the responsibility to uh, deliver their own uh, votes in, in the situation. And then whatever, whatever tactic we convince, whether it be we... we we adopt, whether it be consensus or dictatorship or democracy. Let me give you an example where I think consensus, consensus might work. Let's say we're a workplace and let's say it's just the 15 people I can see on the screen and we're about to hire somebody. I think it might make sense to have that be a consensus decision. Why? Because the, let's say the person we hire uh, is a horrible choice for somebody among this group. Well, I think that person should probably get a veto right? Even if the rest of us like the person who we're about to hire, maybe the, 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 the person who would have to work with them all day long and in their vicinity should have a veto. So sometimes consensus makes sense. Uh, various possibilities make sense. Okay, so, so we come to a new problem, and this is a serious problem, I think. So far, I don't think these problems with self-management are particularly serious. They don't deter me even in, you know, an iota. But the next one is a concern. The next one is, Thatcher says, um, wait a minute, Michael. Is one thing to, for you to say that you're going to consult expertise? Okay, I'll give you that. It's one thing for you to get cute and say that everybody is the best expert on their own preferences. I'll even give you that. But it's not the case that everybody is comparably prepared and able to participate in decision-making. If I go into the, the 
you know, the factory around the corner. And I um, consider the possibility that everybody is going to have a say in decisions, all the workers are going to have a say. It seems to me that we're going to get some bad decisions because people just aren't prepared for that. They, they aren't equipped, they aren't confident, they don't have the social skills, they don't have the kind of broad knowledge and, and so on that is essential to be able to make decisions. Well, I think that's a legitimate concern, but that concern does something that almost every good concern in trying to create a new economy or to conceive a new economy is gonna do. It raises another question for us. How do we deal with that? How do we make it the case that instead of people being unprepared, people are prepared? Instead of lots of people being not good and perhaps making bad decisions, everybody being able and prepared and in, inclined to make good decisions. And so that's the next question that we'll deal with in the next section. Um, this is, I think, the most straightforward section, the one that we've just done. Let me just say one more word about it. What's the virtues of self-management? Well, if we really believe in it, that's the end of capitalism. We, I mean, it, you know, it may seem simple and trivial, no big words, no multiple volumes of, of philosophical rumination. But if we really believe in self-management, then we don't believe in capitalism. We also don't believe in patriarchy and, and uh you know, racial denigration and all the rest of it. Um, but we're mainly talking about the economy today. More importantly, we don't believe in any other kind of hierarchy of power, right? And it treats everybody alike and thereby minimizes alienation. So our next step in the next section is gonna be how to deal with everybody becoming a good decision maker and how to deal with everybody, you know, not being disinclined even to make decisions. Um, but inclined to do so and prepared to do so. Um, but for now, um, regarding the idea of self-management, I think maybe we can open to uh, questions for a while before we go on to the next step. Thank you so much. Oh. Um, so, far. so um, are there any questions uh, regarding self-management, decision-making, the analysis uh, Michael gave us so far? So maybe I start with the question, um, uh, of your notion of decision making, Michael, um, uh, it's at least to me it sounds a little bit um, rationalist, very close to uh, mathematical ideas of decision making. Um, and we all know that decision making in real life um, follows other paths, sympathy, whatever. So, would you please, um, or can you can you tell us a few more? Uh, things about your idea of decision making uh, behind. Well, I mean, we haven't gotten to any actual decisions, um, and I'm I I'm I apologize, but I'm not sure I understand what what you're asking. Uh, a workplace has to decide how much it's producing. A workplace has to decide um, uh, the the way it's organizing itself. A workplace has to decide its schedules and so on and so forth. What self-management does right off is it introduces new problems. One, um, the people have to be in a position to do those things and do them well. That's the thing we're going to talk about next. But it has another problem that comes into play. Self-management says people ha should have a say in decisions to the degree they're affected by them. Well, if we're a bicycle factory and we're deciding on on bicycle production, that certainly affects us, right? How we're gonna do it and what our workday looks like and so on. But it also affects bicycle consumers, right? That is the people who are gonna use the product are affected by whether or not we're making bicycles and we're making them well and we're making enough of them or too few of them and so on. And not only that, it not only affects them, but when we produce bicycles, it uses steel, it uses rubber and so the, the fact that we're using those things means they're not being used for something else. And so it affects the people who might be deprived of something. So if we just create, you know, 40 million bicycles for a country with, uh, 
you know, a population of 20 million. I'm making it absurd, but you can see how we can be overusing stuff. And also there could be pollution, right? And that affects people. So self-management is a very demanding value. Uh, I did it fast and um, uh, without all the implications, but it's a very demanding value because it immediately, if we take it seriously, reveals the extent to which societies are intertwined and decisions affect uh, a wide array of people and institutions have to deliver therefore a wide kind of influence over decisions, uh, which is a very hard norm to fulfill, but we'll try and do it anyway. Uh, and, and the other implication, of course, is that people have to be able to participate and inclined to participate and so on. But I don't, I'm not at all sure I got to your question because I'm not, I'm honestly not really sure I understood it. Um, <laughs> this is the fate of sociologists, um, but okay. Um, Michael, there is another question, but, but thanks so much. Uh, I think you, you, you did already. Um, uh, Simona F., uh, would you please um, contribute personally? <laughs> so my question, I work in uh, health uh, services and in, in health promotion. <clears throat> and part of my job is how to manipulate uh, people in uh, taking good decisions for their health, like uh, eating uh, more vegetables, uh, uh, walking instead of uh, uh, driving a car and so on. So my question is, uh, uh, what if the um, most likely uh, preferences uh, are uh, against uh, people's best interest? Um, how do we deal with uh, this? Well, I guess different people would answer that differently. The person who, who believes that there's the best decision maker, uh, you know, so Castro and Cuba should make all the decisions, would say, well, that's the way we do it. Uh, the decision is going to be made by somebody who is highly astute about everybody's interests and, and will therefore make the decision. Um, or Trump would say, well, I'll just decide for you and screw you. Um, uh, but I don't think that's what we want to gravitate toward. I think what we would say then, you know, if there's a household that's consuming and is consuming in a way that's harmful, uh, you know, there may be some rules in a society um, because of the well-being of children, etc. Uh, but by and large, I think that the solution to people making bad decisions is people becoming more aware uh, if they are decisions that are bad. And uh, I also think that it's often that it's bad decisions in somebody's opinion, but not in somebody else's opinion. And what participation and self-management says is that, you know, we don't get to uh, enforce our views upon others. Um, I, I'm thinking maybe we should move on because the first section is the relatively more straightforward one. If, if let me just put it this way. If somebody wants to suggest that self-management isn't a good idea, and there are political organizations that feel this way. Uh, actually, Mary Bookchin felt this way. He felt one person, one vote, majority rules is the correct uh, approach to decision making. I think it's fair to say that. And or and anyway, somebody could feel that. And um, so that's not a tactic, that's not a method, that's not an algorithm, that is the goal uh, for decision making. And I'm saying no, the goal for decision making is participatory self-management, let's call it, and democracy is one method uh, that applies in many, many circumstances, but doesn't apply in some other circumstances. Here is uh, one more question Albert, in the chat. The question is, is, is it right that according to your theory, we would not need regulations about orthography, which I would appreciate because it does not really affect others how one writes? Okay, so um, being from the United States, I am an incredibly ignorant human being. I have no idea what orthography is, um, but it doesn't really matter much. Um, that is put in the word pornography, put in the word, put in killing people, right? So in a good society, 
there will be things that are off limits that are not, that, you know, that is, there will be legal structures, there will be agreed norms, uh, and there can be that in the economy too. So that's quite possible. Um, but those are details for the future. Let me make one more point in this first section, I guess. Um, what's a vision? What's a vision for a better future? What, what is our goal, not for decision making, but for our economic vision? My answer to that question is it's rather limited. Uh, our goal for economic vision is not to figure out how long people are going to work 20 years or 50 years in the future, or what products they will like or not like, or in other words, what decisions they will make. It's not the details. It's also not the details of how um, particular uh, uh, um, issues are carried out. It, doesn't, it isn't for us now to decide, okay, how much uh, consensus, how much democracy, how much whatever inside each workplace. Our task, I think, is to figure out institutions that deliver to future, future people control over their own lives, self-managing control over their own lives. Our task, at least with this first value, is to put people in the future in position to make those decisions that are not our province now. It's not for us now to decide how people are going to decide about whatever orthography is or pornography or anything else, right? What, what it's our task to do is to deliver a social situation, a social structure, a set of institutions that future people can use to determine how they want to live. Um, so that's, that's my goal for vision um, on the one side. And on the other side, it would be nice if vision was sufficient to answer the question, what do we want, was sufficient to give direction to current activity, um, to orient it, et cetera, to be useful in the present. So let's go on to the second section, which is really a close continuation of the first. And the second issue is, okay, Thatcher said, uh, look, it sounds groovy, but we'll all suffer immeasurably because there'll be bad decisions because not everybody is going to be in position to be sensible about decision-making. And I think that's a, fair, that's a fair concern. People being ready for self-management. So suppose we look at the economy and we look at what we have right now. And we look inside of a workplace, and this could be a workplace in the United States today, or in England or Italy or wherever today, or in China, or in the Soviet Union, any year that you want to pick, um, uh, or in Cuba, wherever you want. If we look, we see something that's called corporate division of labor. And what do I mean by that? I mean that if we look at the jobs that exist inside workplaces, we see something I think interesting. The interesting thing isn't the very detailed specifics of each job. It's that we can broadly speaking, group jobs into two categories or two types. One type of job is such that the person doing it by virtue of doing it, right? Uh, receives information, knowledge, has interactions with others, develops certain social skills, develops a degree of confidence. We can call these things empowering aspects of life. One set of jobs has attributes or characteristics that help to empower um, the person doing them. But then there's another kind of job another set of jobs in this division of labor, which are very different. This other set of jobs, doing it actually disempowers the people who are doing it. The second kind of job, doing it diminishes your knowledge of the overall situation. It, it reduces your ties to others, your social connections and your social skills in some sense. It, reduces your confidence, it disempowers, it bores, it involves 
obedience, subordination, your access to levers of decision making, they reduce to nil. And the first kind of job, you do have access to levers of decision making. So the idea here is that not just in capitalism, but in most economies that we can talk about, and we'll address that a little bit in a minute, uh, we have these two broad categories of work, empowering work and disempowering work. And now if we ask about what the implication of that is for self-management, I think it becomes pretty clear. The implication is the disempowering work reduces the inclination, the disposition, the preparedness to participate in decision-making. And the empowering work does the opposite. And the result of that is that we have, and now if we look again at that categorization of jobs, we discover very interestingly that about 20%, roughly speaking, are empowering and 80% are disempowering. That's the way it looks in place after place after place. And so if we look at that, we think to ourselves, okay, now we've got a group of 20% and we've got a group of 80%. And uh, uh, are they, what, what, what are they? Can we give them a name? I think we can. I think it in fact behooves us to do so. And so this becomes another big step in participatory economics. Uh, so we call the 80% the working class. That's the people who are working inside firms and they are disempowered by the activity that they are doing. We call the 20%, I'll call them the coordinator class. Once upon a time, Barbara and John Aaron, I called them the professional managerial class. Uh, others have given them other names. It doesn't matter so much what we call them, but since I'm used to it, I'll call them the coordinator class. So we have a 20% coordinator class and an 80% working class, roughly speaking. So uh, is that any different than, and you know, I don't know whether this statistic makes any sense, but we have 20% left-handed people and 80% right-handed people or whatever it is. Does it matter any more than that? And the answer is it does. And why does it matter any more than more that? Well, Thatcher told us because the 80% are not ready and prepared and decline and inclined to participate and make decisions and the 20% are. And so what happens? Well, now let me tell you a, a story about a trip I made to Argentina, I guess about uh, 20 years ago, uh, when the Argentine factories were taken over in large numbers. Um, so there were a few hundred factories taken over. They typically were taken over by the workforce because they were failing this was all at once going on in Argentina because they were failing and the workers were taking over the factory because unlike the capitalist who just simply moved on and was going to make their profit someplace else, the workers had no place to go. But the coordinator class inside the factory, the engineers, the managers, various people whose work was empowering, they looked at the capitalists packing up and they decided I'm going too. Without the capitalists, this is going to fail. And so I'm getting out of here also. So they left also. So what happened is the working class participants in the workplaces, the 80%, took over these factories. And they met and they discussed and they decided to try and run the factories because they wanted to continue their lives, for one thing. Uh, and they, they almost immediately formed what? Workers' councils, right? That was automatic. Right, was they, they immediately knew, look, we're in charge, so we need this venue. So they took the first step, no, no problem. They also did some other things. They tended to equalize wages. We'll come to that in a while. Uh, and they tend to introduce immediately democracy. And in some cases, something much more closer to, to self-management. And then they operate. And so I'm in Argentina and I'm in a meeting in a, uh, in a, a, a meeting hall. And there's about 50 people there and they're from factories all over Argentina. And in the beginning, it's very animated and upbeat because after all, they're sharing this experience that they're all having of taking over their workplaces and their lives. And uh, they're, they're excited. And, and then we start, I, I suggest, oh, I was there to give a talk. Um, so I was uh, convening this thing. So, um, I suggested we go around the room and get some feedback from people about what they're up to. And we did that. And um, pretty soon, very soon, 
a couple of people talking, the mood mellowed and three or four more people and the mood was horrible, um, depressed. And uh, then somebody went and said, I never thought I would say anything like this. I can't imagine I'm gonna say this, but maybe Margaret Thatcher was right. That's literally what the person said. Um, it was Argentina, but they know the UK. And uh, Thatcher was the prime minister who said there is no alternative. And he said, maybe Margaret Thatcher is right. We took over the workplace. We instituted full democracy. We had our, our, our council. We equalized our wages. We, we battled against alienation. And it's six or seven months later and all the old crap is coming back. And so I interrupted at that point. Um, this, this it was clearly resonating around the room. And I said, do you, do you think that it's because modern advanced industrialized societies make that inevitable? Or is it that you think human nature makes that inevitable? And they were all nodding um, that they didn't wanna, some of them were crying, that they didn't wanna feel this way, but that they, they couldn't, they, they did. And I said, well, wait a second. When you took over your workplace, did you maintain the old jobs that existed in your workplace? And at first they didn't understand the question. And then they said, well, of course we did. Well, you know, what else were we gonna do, right? To, to them, it was sort of like, if I had said, did you, do you still have lunch in the workplace? And they would say, of course we still have lunch, you idiot. So of course we still have the jobs that we had. And then we talked about how it was that a subset of those jobs empowered people and a subset disempowered people. And so despite the fact that the person who was now doing the accounting in the firm had been a worker, had been working, let's say, all day long, like the rest of them in a disempowering job, um, despite that fact, that person now was different. That person now was much more confident. That person now knew what was going on all over the workplace. That person now had ties to a subset of other people in the workplace. And basically what we were discovering was that all the old crap was coming back because the old division of labor was creating a class division. There's no owner, but was creating a class division in the workplace between a coordinator class and a working class. And the coordinator class was starting to do things like increase its own wages because it looked around and it said to itself, I'm making the decisions, I'm more important, I'm smarter, I'm more responsible, I deserve more. Those other people, they deserve less. And so all the old crap was coming back because this class division, it was out with the old boss, the owner, in with the new boss, the coordinator class. So what do you do about this? Uh, what are the implications uh, of this? How do, you, how do you solve it? So like most things, I sort of think in terms of trying to create a simple analogy and see if it has any implications. So I remember thinking to myself, um, suppose I went to another planet and on that other planet, workplaces were like they are here. They look the same as they do here. Um, but I investigated and I discovered that at the beginning of each workday, 20% of the workforce ate a chocolate bar and 80% didn't. And then I inquired and asked around and it turned out on this planet, uh, chocolate um, uh, conveyed information. It conveyed knowledge. It conveyed confidence. It conveyed social connections to other people. And so 20% were getting all that and 80% weren't. And I then asked myself, well, what would I have to do to make these workplaces self-managing in the sense that we talked about to get everybody involved and participating in good decisions? And the answer was share the chocolate. It's trivial. And, you know, I've done this with kids of, you know, 10 years old and their answer is share the chocolate. So now what do we have to do is in the transition, let's call it from a capitalist firm or a coordinator class firm, a firm in the ostensibly socialist Soviet Union, 
in which you have the same division of labor inside the workplace, a coordinator class and a working class, and in which the coordinator class dominates. So the coordinator class now, instead of being between labor and capital, is the ruling class. What do you have to do to move from that to what we want? What, 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 to a classless situation, to a situation where there's real self-management? Well, the answer is share the chocolate, share the empowering work. And so the second step, I think, in, in envisioning a desirable economy is to recognize you not only have to get rid of private ownership of the means of production so that you don't have a capitalist who dominates, but you have to get rid of the corporate division of labor so you don't have a coordinator class that don dominates. And so what does that mean to get rid of the corporate division of labor? To me, it means that you have to redefine jobs in such a way that each job in a workplace, each job in the economy, uh, has attributes that are comparably empowering for that job to the attributes that other jobs have. So when we go into the workplace, we are all comparably empowered, comparably prepared to develop our ideas of what we want, to develop agendas, to argue for them, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there's a lot of implications of this, obviously. Um, let me just do a couple and then uh, we'll move on to uh, questions about all this. We call them balanced job, or I call them balanced job complexes. So it's in practice, it's that kind of thing. In a hospital, you no longer have the hospital administrators, the surgeons, and people cleaning up after everybody. You have to have, now obviously you don't do this overnight, but you have to have jobs which are comparably empowering to all who are occupying those jobs and likewise across the whole economy. Um, so what's the problem? Thatcher now is having an embolism. She, she's going berserk that I'm out of my mind. And why is she doing that? She's saying, are you crazy? You're saying, I, I follow you. She's saying, you're saying that a surgeon who's currently working 30 hours a day, I mean, 30 hours a week or 40 or 50 hours a week doing surgery, if surgery is empowering, of course, we haven't determined that yet, but if surgery is empowering, and if being a surgeon is empowering, makes people think like they're gods, um, then they have to do less of that. And we're going to lose a lot of surgery. We're going to lose, let's say, 20% or 30% or 50% of society's surgery. You're consigning us to death in order to have self-management. We'll be self-managing death. There is no alternative, right? Attaining self-management while we all die is not an alternative. And she'd be right if it was true. So it's a legitimate concern to raise. And so what's the answer? On the one hand, of course, it implies more training. And so we'll have to talk about what that. But, but the bigger thing that it implies or that it says is the idea that 20% are capable of empowering work, 80% are not. That's the underlying assumption. The assumption is it's not the case that 80% are doing disempowering work because they are robbed of the opportunity of doing empowering work because they are channeled into that from virtually birth and that the 20% the are in the opposite situation. That's not the reason. The reason, she says, is because of in, intrinsic capacity of the people. And so you have to be able to argue against that. And my way of arguing against that is to say, think back 50 years, put all the surgeons in a stadium, a giant stadium for the whole US and look around. What do you see? So you see overwhelmingly men, overwhelmingly white. And what's the explanation? Women can't do it and blacks can't do it. And does it seem convincing to a lot of people? Yes, because it's a possible explanation, right? That is to say, if women couldn't do it and blacks couldn't do it, then the reason they aren't there is because they can't do it. And so it becomes sort of convincing. It even convinces some women and blacks 50 years ago. But now we know that it was rubbish, that it wasn't the case. We should have known it then. A lot of people did know it then, but a lot of people didn't. And now we know it, but now it's the same thing. 
right? It's the same thing. 80% are just not capable of it. They need to be cared for by the 20%. That's one of the attributes of coordinator class consciousness, a kind of paternalism, a kind of, um, you know, we deserve what we get because we take care of all of you. Okay, so in any case, the, the answer is the claim of participatory economics, and if it's false, I got a problem. The claim of participatory economics is that the 80% can certainly do empowered work. Now, just to get it out of the way, that doesn't mean I can be a surgeon. I could not be a surgeon for all kinds of reasons. It just means that each person can do a mix of responsibilities and tasks, which has comparably empowering effects. It doesn't mean we can all be Einstein or we can all be surgeons or we can all be linguists or whatever it is. It just means that we can all do, do a balanced job and then participate in the workplace. So the, um, the message of this section, I guess, is that uh, we're rejecting, now we not only rejected capitalism, but now we already have quickly rejected, maybe people haven't noticed, but 20th century socialism. We have, direct, we have rejected an economy in which the coordinator class becomes the new ruling class. We have said that that should not be the case, that violates classlessness and it also violates self-management. So we rejected that. It achieves classlessness, at least so far, maybe other institutions would disrupt that, but it achieves it so far. Uh, and it has implications, for example, for education, for all kinds of things that are quite profound. Um, but let's, let's pause there and see what we've got in the way of uh, questions to, to address. Thank you, Albert, <clears throat> for this, uh, Mike, Michael, for this um, second part. Um, <clears throat> this is really challenging um, our mindsets because there are some ideologies that are still, well, um, popular. For example, talent is rare, um, etc. And this was proven definitely wrong empirically. But okay, let's say, let's have a look if there are some. Uh, comments or some questions regarding uh, the second part. Said one opposition to this is talent is rare. Talent is rare is not a critique of this. It isn't even a problem. Certain kinds of talent is rare. Um, I venture to guess that nobody in, in this whole group of 100 or however many it is can play basketball like LeBron James, uh, can sing like Adele, or can. Uh, um, think like Chomsky. Uh, I, I venture to guess that that's the case. So talent at a certain level of a certain sort is rare. But what we're talking about is talent to be able to do um, empowering work, empowering tasks, not specific empowering tasks, right? But any empowering tasks, right? It's not the case that all white males could be in that surgery camp, you know, uh, uh, stadium that I created. But there were enough white males. So what's being said is that the 20% of the, I mean, the 80% of the population that's the working class can generate more than enough um, quality activity to take the place of the 20% the that, you know, the part of the 20%'s output that we lose because they have to do a balanced job complex too, right? So uh, the fact that, you know, somebody with a lot of talent has to do not just that talent thing, which actually is very rare anyway, but not just that talent thing, but a, a balanced mix means that some from some place we need to replace that. And my argument is, uh, that it is easily replaced, in fact, overwhelmingly replaced from the 80%. Uh, the 80% that is no longer trained, socialized, and then structurally pressured by their position in the economy to endure boredom and take orders. Um, that, but that is instead, um, uh, to, to use a U.S. Army uh, slogan, um, welcome to be the best person they can be. 
the most capable person they can be or that they want to be. Um, when society is organized that way, there will be more than enough capacity. Just like women, it turns out, are now about 50% of the medical profession in the United States. Um, uh, that certainly puts the lie to the notion that women can't be doctors, right? But we shouldn't have needed that, but it does obviously literally prove we won't literally know that the 80% can do empowering work until they are, but I don't think there's any problem with it. Um, thank you for the talk and the questions and ideas. I studied a lot um, the Democratic Republic of Germany and real socialism and market socialism, this kind of stuff, and also Argentina. And what John Holloway says that who will come tomorrow, he says that the problem is not that there is a still a coordinator class within these Argentinian um, enterprises, which I think is part of the problem. I, I agree with you; it is part of the problem. But there is still competition and markets. They they get. They have the enterprise, but they still have to produce in competition against each other. And if I look at real socialism, I find it kind of similar stuff because it's also a society based on wage labor, as is market socialism. One and also your approach is for me like kind of pretty much similar to it. And if you pay people to do ah, okay, that's then you can. I would be happy to have your answer. But if you have if you force people or if you bind the consumption of people to their achievement in work, then they will work because it's the only play a possibility to sustain their life. But this leads to what Marx called that they orient their production at exchange labor and not use value or exchange. Value. I think you got the point already. Or but it's not just that I have the point. It's, it's two sections on. If any of you um, get into the task of thinking about economic vision or political vision or familial kinship vision or cultural vision one of the difficult things is to not race ahead of yourself it's it's a little bit like the thing i said all the way back at the beginning where in the 60s they would say what the hell do you want to stop us right you have at least in my way of thinking about it you have to take it a step at a time and what you're pointing out and you're exactly right is that when we get to allocation, the wrong allocation system can screw up everything that we've done already, right? What, what we just gave was an example of that. The corporate division of labor is an institution. It's an institutional structure. And what we said with that Argentine example is that if you retain the corporate division of labor, you can be for self-management. You can have set up your workers' council. You can be sincere about it. You can really believe in it, right? You can even have a group of people who are comrades, right? The corporate division of labor is gonna fuck it all up because the corporate division of labor is going to not only produce glass or, or violins or whatever the workplace is producing, but it's gonna produce class division. And that class division will intensify and become class rule. And so if allocation will do something like that also, then even if we have balanced job complexes instead of a corporate division of labor, if we screw up remuneration or allocation, we might screw up everything that we've got already. So, and that's what you're driving at, I think. And we'll have to see whether we make that mess. But at this point, we have the prior question of whether or not anybody thinks that um, after all, balanced job complexes are a big change, right? And uh, you can't do it overnight, but they're a big change. Um, let me give you one more example of why they're a big change. Vision matters for now. If we want to plant the seeds of the future in the present, if we want to raise consciousness of what it is we desire, if we want to have the benefits of what we desire active now, well, then we have to start thinking about implementing what we're talking about for the future in the present. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means in movement organizations and movement projects in say media organizations on the left and so on, we should have balanced job complexes. The logic is the same as we should not have Jim Crow racism in those institutions. We should not have patriarchy in those institutions. We should steadily try to get rid of all that in our own institutions. 
Well, likewise, we should not have a corporate division of labor in our own institutions. And some of you may know that we haven't been very good at, about even raising that as an issue, much less achieving it. So there, there is a question in the chat. Um, are the working class actually 80% or are they far less and the numbers are only chosen for better understanding? No. Um, the, the term middle class, right, is often used. It doesn't really mean anything. So the coordinator class means something, empowered workers, um, uh, workers who are uh, in, in positions because of their bargaining power and capitalism, they make much more income, they're able to take more income, and they're in position to influence outcome, out, outcomes. And then the 80% is the other way. Is the 80% much less? Well, um, I don't mean to offend anybody, but by and large, everybody thinks they're in the coordinator class or because it's not called the coordinator class, it's called the middle class. Everybody thinks they're in the middle class. Um, but that's so that we don't have to think that we're in the lowly working class and we don't want to think we're in the, you know, the oppressive capital class. So we think of ourselves as in the middle class and that tends to cause everybody to think that there's this huge middle class. There isn't. Um, uh, no, I think 80-20 is um, pretty accurate. Um, think about a workplace and ask yourself how many people in that workplace are doing rote work as compared to the number of people who are doing uh, empowering work. Now, at Microsoft proper, it's not 80-20, right? I don't know what it is. It might be 80-20 the other way, right? It, it might be 80% of doing empowering and 20% of doing rote, cleaning the place, et cetera, et cetera. So there are different workplaces. But in overall, in the whole economy, I think 80-20 is pretty accurate. Uh, is there paid enough, enough uh, attention to the amount of people that is coordinator class? Because there was the saying of um, um, David Graeber, we are in 99%. And uh, some people criticized that we are not the 99%. There is a coordinator class, call it whatever you want. People with good jobs that won't get rid of them. They want, they cling to these jobs because they are, as you said, empowering. So um, I, I think this, this number matters, how much or how big this uh, coordinator yeah. class is. And also their power matters. It's not they have uh, different interests, like the 1%, the, the real rulers, the capitalist class. But um, what do you think is are their interests and how do they differ from the working class and how do they differ from the capitalist class? Okay. Um, well, again, I, I, you know, I think if you pose it as 1% or 2% at the top and 98% of the, of the rest, uh, that's very useful to the coordinator class, if I'm right that there is a coordinator class, right? Uh, one of the things Marx actually said is if you want to understand and deal with ideologies, you have, to, you have to ask what it leaves out, right? So if a particular school of thought leaves out the existence of something, you should pay attention to that because it may mean that it is serving the interests of that. So bourgeois economics basically doesn't talk much about class at all, about owners at all. And, and that's because they're serving the interest of owners. Um, I think uh, to get controversial, uh, Marxism Leninism is the ideology of the, of the coordinator class. I think it um, elevates the coordinator class to ruling class status. Um, uh, that's what happens in practice. It's what's happened over and over in practice and it's not an accident. So the, the, what is the views of the coordinator class? Well, the, the capitalist class we know wants to monopolize, wants to uh, 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 increase profits maximally and retain control over re accruing profits. Two things really. It isn't just maximizing profits. It's also maintaining the conditions that let them maximize profits. What's the coordinator class about? Well, the coordinator class about is about uh, it sees itself often as hostile to, sometimes serving, sometimes kowtowing to 
sometimes succumbing to the owners, but it often is rather hostile to the owners because it thinks they're a bunch of idiots and we know what we're doing, right? So that's looking upward, that's one kind of dynamic, except it's weak compared to the owners. And so at different times in history, different, different things result. But looking downward, I think the coordinator class looks at the working class as being not capable, as being uh, uh, of less capacity to do uh, empowering things. Uh, and it, at the, in the plus side or in the more positive version, it cares about them. And so paternalistically sort of concerns itself with their well-being. And in the not so positive side, it just says, fuck them and let's advance. Yeah, this is all oversimplified, of course, but um, roughly speaking, uh, is it important? Well, yeah, I think it is important. I think every anti-capitalist revolution that has happened has uh, entrenched the coordinator class into it's retaining and enlarging its sway over those below. Uh, and that's, you, you can imagine a more and less liberal, a more or less um, uh, humane capitalism, and you can imagine a more or less humane coordinator um, economy. Uh, but it isn't what we want, and, and we'll see as we go along. So this is a big implication of participatory economics, to be sure. Now, somebody might say quite reasonably, wait a minute, if we pose that the coordinator class are bad guys and we don't want a coordinator economy, which they rule, are we saying they are the enemy and we should treat them with the same disdain and the same hostility as we treat owners? And the answer is, First, the reality. Um, in the United States, the working class does regard those people, not just with the same hostility and the same anger that they regard owners, but with more hostility and more anger than they regard owners. Why? Because they encounter them. Because they, and they literally come face to face with and encounter the doctors, the engineers, the lawyers, the people in court, the managers, and they have to succumb to them. And so by and large, the plight of the, Amer of the working class in the United States say is that this is the group that they, that they are hostile towards. And that's why they can, I think, um, you know, sort of rein in their hostility at capital and support Trump, but they can't rein in their hostility at the coordinator class and support Clinton who comes off Hillary Clinton, who comes off as that, or Biden. Um, along comes Sanders, and then they start to think maybe we've got something here. Anyway, that's a sidebar. But uh, if, if, this, if the implication of participatory economics is for us to run around with signs that say, hang the, the, the surgeons, hang the doctors, hang, that's not going to be a good change. But if it causes us to understand that our movements should elevate working people, should make demands about work that tends to empower working people, should make its own structures incorporate and elevate working people, that then it is a good effect, a very good effect. Um, and so that's a strategic issue sort of beyond today, but how you do that is very important. Uh, uh, part of how you create a movement that is owned, so to speak, and implements, uh, de develops and implements the will, not of coordinators, but of working people. Uh, and many coordinators will stay on the other side, and many coordinators will line up with that movement, I think. Uh, because they will want classlessness, they will want liberty, they will want freedom, they will want justice, etc. Um, and they will be able to see past um, the inconvenience of their having to suddenly do their fair share of disempowering work. I hope that's the case anyway. Yeah, just two commands. First of all, sociological perspective, um, particularly from the 
social structure analysis, um, I think this uh, will clearly confirm your model. Maybe it's, uh, it, it differs in the terminology. So, um, you know, particularly German sociologists avoid uh, more or less completely the notion of class, of social classes. Um, they replaced it by social strata, which are not that you know, brutal. <laughs> um, so, um, and it is um, what, what you uh, call the um, a coordinator class is called here more or less the ruling class. And then below the ruling class, we have the middle class. So this is a little bit confusing with, um, in, in terminology, but principally the empirical uh, studies all around uh, Europe confirm um, your model. I think you can differ the, or you can you can sub differentiate the the eighty uh, percent even more, of course. But uh, this twenty percent are relatively stable um, in most of the European countries. There are some exceptions, like Iceland, for example. They are pretty good, <laughs> but um, the like Italy, France, Germany, etc. Um, all these countries have this class U uh, report. Any, dig any designation is going to be sort of fluid at the edges, right? Um, so, for example, two groups in the United States right now um, that are uh, very active and very engaged in progressive and radical politics are nurses and teachers. And it, it, I suspect that that why are they uh, seemingly more so than other than other groups? It might well be that they're because of their roles, their socialization is less effective at making them uh, subordinate, at making them accept their working class position, at at disempowering them, and so with more confidence they move earlier. I mean, this is just hypothesizing, but I suspect it's it's got it's some got basis. Um, okay, next question um, is, um, do you think universal basic income might be a first step to encourage people to have jobs that are empowering by removing the need of sustaining themselves? Uh, maybe, I don't know. Uh, questions like that are quite complicated. A universal basic income would be good for various reasons. It would put a higher floor on uh, the pain, that is less pain and suffering that people have. I would think that would be the main thing. Most of these discussions are really weird to me. Um, so for instance, in the United States, that's not widely discussed, but raising the minimum income is discussed. What the hell is a minimum income, right? It makes no sense that there's a minimum income. Uh, it certainly makes no sense that the minimum income is $15 an hour, right? So what, how does the left approach that? Well, this would come up in our remuneration issue, but I would think without giving it away, the way the left, or without doing too much now, the way the left would approach that would be to say, this is what we really favor. This is why raising the minimum income is a step in the right direction. And when we fight to raise the minimum income, we should be raising consciousness and developing organization to move toward what we really want. And you're describing the universal basic income the same way, right? You're saying basically, uh, look, universal income, universal basic income, A, it makes people's lives less painful who are in trouble now. So that's good. And, and the left should be for things that do that, not callous about that. Um, so that's good. And in addition, we could fight for it in a way that tries to um, further the, the values that we have, which we haven't said what they are yet uh, about income. Next, next question. I have doubts about what about that, which is how allocates that? The people who control the process will have disproportionate power anyway. Okay, well, we'll see when we get to that. If the question is, how do we allocate, that's the fourth step. If the question is, if we allocate in a way which gives a subset of people disproportionate power, won't we be violating self-management? Answer, yes, right? 
th that's correct. We will be. And if we via if we allocate in such a way that we produce a class division, that we once again produce, say, a coordinator class above a working class, will we have destroyed the capacity of our councils to be self-managing? Answer: Yes. Uh, will we have destroyed the the maintenance of balanced job complexes? Yes. We will, and we'll see how markets, for example, would do exactly that. Um, there is another question about empowering, uh, empowering work. Is empowering work always good? I think jobs in the repressive sector, for example, police, can be experienced as being quite empowering yeah. by those who have the badge and the guns. But sure. it also trains them to be subordinate and often enough brutal, not fulfilling the human potential emotion. Yeah, life is complex. But um, no, of course not. You could have empowering work that's disgusting, um, that's disgusting for the people who are the victims of it, and that may even be in some sense disgusting for the people who are perpetrating it, although they don't see it that way, of course. Um, and so in a good society, you can raise the question, what about policing? We can do that maybe. Well, what have we said so far that would be relevant to what about policing? We've said that we want self-management. If we have policing, policing affects the communities that are policed. Therefore, the communities that are policed have to have a say, right? They have to have influence over that. So we're already moving toward community control of whatever that is, um, or community involvement in control of whatever that is. We also have said we have to have balanced job complexes. So if policing is incredibly empowering, Uh, then you can't do only policing, right? You would have to have a balanced job complex. I, I don't know whether it is or not, but let's say it is. So in other words, what we've done, what we've said already has implications for these things. Now we can ask whether or not, you know, mm -hmm. I, 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 it, it, there is this problem that any question tends to push us to the next step, which is good, That should be mm -hmm. the case, but that's not the way it's organized. So anyway, go ahead. Next question is, in the case of salaries of women, lower salaries are rarely justified at all. Employed women in Austria earn 17% less than male colleagues. No reason could be found for that except their gender. Having said this, even if women belong to the coordinator class, they would earn less. How to deal with this problem? Actually, um, it used to be the case a long time ago that I discovered that lots of women were doctors in the Soviet Union, like 50 years ago, and that surprised me. And then it turned out that, the, in fact, the, the position being a doctor in the Soviet Union had lost its luster and its income. And so the fact that women were doing it wasn't contradictory to patriarchy. It was just a different piece in a different place. And it, all right, anyway. Um, Uh, we're, we're back to remuneration. Um, I, what I would say is the reason women get lower pay is indeed because they're women, but not because they're women biologically. It's not because uh, it's because uh, pay, social structures create a situation in which entering the economy by virtue of patriarchy throughout society, women have less bargaining power. And in a market system, it's bargaining power that by and large governs income. And so they have less pay. That's off the, off the beaten trail a little bit. Um, what, what we, we haven't done remuneration yet, but we've already done balanced job complexes. And that sort of tells us something about this issue. Uh, can you have uh, men predominating and empowering work? No, because you can't have anybody predominating and empowering work. I mean, we didn't even raise the question, but If you're going to divide up empowering work fairly among the whole population, then you're also going to divide it up fairly among men and women and among uh, different cultural communities and so on. That's already sort of been accomplished without literally explicitly raising it. Now it's a struggle, but the structure does it. Um, uh, Yeah, of course, there's no justification for women getting less than men. That's true. But there's no justification for either women or men getting as low as they do. Um, we'll see that when we do remuneration in a minute. Uh, the world is entirely upside down with respect to income. Actually, with respect to almost everything, but certainly. 
there were some questions that people might be not hesitant to ask in this room or at, on the large scale, but they, they deserve asking. And one of them was, if it's, it wasn't put this way, the person was too much, much too nice, but I might put it this way if I was asking it of me. If it's so good, if it delivers self-management, if it delivers classlessness, and if we're going to see it delivers equity and it delivers efficient allocation, then why the fuck aren't more people for it? Why isn't it more visible? Why isn't it more supported? And maybe somebody should ask that at the end, and I'll try and answer it the way I tried to answer it in the breakout room. Do you want me to move into remuneration? So this would be the third issue, decisions, uh, distribution of work, how we do our work. And now we come to this problem of the pie, how we divide things up, not the system, not the allocation system, but what do we, what do we want? What, what do we really want? So when we're fighting for a, in the United States, the $15 minimum income, which is a joke, the people who earn the minimum income should be earning the most income in society not $15, not $25, but more than anybody else is earning. We'll see why in a minute. But in any case, when we fight for a minimum income, if all we're doing is fighting for that and then we go home, then the only thing we need to know is that we want $15 an hour or $25 an hour or whatever it is. But if we're fighting for that as part of a process that we want to create a new economy, then when we're fighting for that, we should be speaking and organizing and acting in such a way as to try and develop desire, not just for the $15 an hour, which when we win, we're satisfied, but for a just income, an equitable income. And therefore we have to be able to talk about what that is and what we mean by it and to develop support for it and to understand it. So uh, economists tell us that one way to to determine income is that you get what your property produces. I'm gonna spend almost zero time on this. This means that, uh, 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 I don't have the statistics at my fingertips, but broadly speaking, you know, you own Amazon and you're more, you own more in a day than the person who works for you earns in, um, I forget how many friggin' years, but uh, you know, a hundred years, um, really ludicrous gap. Um, so I'm going to assume that we, we ruled out um, private ownership on grounds that it violated uh, self-management, but now we can also rule it out on grounds that if you get everything that your property produces, if you get back um, based on your property's production, uh, then we'll have vast disparities of wealth and income, and that will lead to the injustice that that is. We haven't figured out why that's an injustice yet, or, uh, but also to a violation of uh, self-management. The second norm, I suppose you could say for the distribution of uh, income is power. Uh, call it bargaining power if you want. I actually think this one is quite operative in market systems um, and even dominant in market systems. So if you have a good union, you earn more. If you don't, you earn less. If you're male, you earn more. If you're female, you earn less. Why? Because sexism throughout society means you have less bargaining power as a woman and therefore you earn less. Uh, and uh, so on for other, uh, Al Capone was once interviewed. Uh, he said, I love America. Person asked him, what do you think about America? Uh, I love America, America is wonderful because in America you get what you can take, right? And that's in fact exactly what a bargaining power is, you get what you can take. Uh, it's a thug's economy and I'm gonna assume nobody likes that. So we'll jump over that. Uh, so we've ruled out property and we've ruled out power. And now comes one that lots of socialists um, support. Uh, so there are lots of people um, who are socialists, who call themselves socialists, uh, some anarchists also, um, not too many though. Uh, who favor the following. You should get back from the pie, the social pie that's produced in society, you should get back a piece that represents or is in accord with or is proportional to the amount you contribute to the pie. 
So some goes to investment and some goes to uh, dealing with, uh, uh, with the well-being of those who can't work and some goes to collective goods and so on. But after that, you get back a share proportionate to what you contributed to the pie by virtue of your labors. And the argument is relatively simple. It, it, actually, it's quite simple. If I get less than I contributed, somebody else is getting some of mine, right? Right. It, I, I'm not saying I get back only pieces of pie. I get back food, I get back housing, I get back violins, I get back computer, whatever I choose. But the total value of what I get back, if it's less than what I put in, somebody's getting some of mine. And if I get more than I put in, then I'm getting some of somebody else's. And the socialist who supports this says that's unjust. We've got it. This is our norm for uh, remuneration. And if this is our norm for remuneration, we would then have to figure out a institution which fulfills the norm, just like we've had to come up with workers and consumers councils for self-management and balanced job complexes for classlessness in the workplace and so on. Okay, so what do we do we like this one or do we not? I don't. I don't think this is a good norm at all. And there are a number of reasons why. But the essence of it is this. Um, what it does is it rewards you for things about which you had nothing to do with. So um, everybody know who LeBron James is, basketball, well, it doesn't matter. A, a, a super talented basketball player is born with these talents or a super talented singer is born with those talents or a super talented thinker is born, born with those talents. And the question is, having been born with these talents, should we then, on top of luck in the genetic lottery, and that's what it is, right? You didn't get these talents because you did something great to get them. It's a genetic lottery. And so you got them in the genetic lottery. And should we reward you with lots of income by virtue of that? Okay, so hold that one for a minute. What about luck in the tools lottery? Suppose I'm working with better tools than somebody else. So I and uh, somebody else, Kurt here, um, go out into the fields and the genetic lottery might be that Kurt is uh, six feet tall, uh, 185 pounds and strong as a bull and I'm frigging small and weak, and we go out into the fields to do something that's strenuous, cut sugarcane, to use a Cuban example, and his stack of stuff is this big and my stack is this big, right? His is much bigger and mine is much smaller because of the genetic lottery. Should he get back the much higher income or not? And what if he has a bet, what if I have a better tool? I have a tool that's so good that now my stack is much bigger than his stack. Should I get back the greater income? And th these are real questions. And the answers that people give matter to what kind of economy, what kind of institutions we adopt. And the answer of many socialists is that we should remunerate, give income for contribution to the social product. And if we do that, let's take an example. Suppose LeBron James, who's a basketball player in the United States, earns $40 million next year for playing basketball and also going to practice sessions. He doesn't only play basketball, he also goes to practice sessions. How many people think he is overpaid? All right, you, uh, Zoom sessions, forget it. You can't, uh, if you don't all think that, I'll be surprised. A few of you won't think that. Few of you will say, no, he's underpaid, and you'll be right. If we adopt the social this norm that he should be remunerated for his contribution to the social product. He is literally underpaid, right? The population likes watching LeBron James play basketball so much that the, his total contribution to the social product is worth more than his $40 million a year salary. Why doesn't he get it all? Well, because Nike gets some of it. Because the owner of, now it's the Los Angeles Lakers before Chicago. Anyway, the, the owner of the team that he plays on gets some of it. He doesn't have enough bargaining power to get all of it. 
but he has a shitload of bargaining power and he gets a whole lot. And if we don't like that, it's because we don't really like remunerating that kind of thing. Now let's take another example that Robin and I used to take at the outset because he was literate, not me. Um, Mozart and Salieri, two composers. So Mozart composes stuff and Salieri at the same time in history composes stuff. And Mozart, if we pay for the, the value of the product to the population, right? Then Mozart gets a huge income. In fact, Mozart's relatives probably now own you know, a third of Europe or something. And Salieri would get a much, much, much lower income. That's rewarding their genetic talent. And what, what I'm saying is we shouldn't do that. Now, it, it, it's not, values are not right and wrong. I mean, they're not true and false. I can't say it is false to reward genetic endowment, but I can say that the results of rewarding genetic endowment, the results of rewarding luck in the tool lottery, and we could add some others, the results of that stuff is wide disparities of income, which will lead to wide disparities of power, which will violate self-management, and which will lead to a redefining of work by those with the greater power. It, it will corrupt all of what we've been doing. And also it's wrong because I think it's immoral. So what do we do then? If we don't reward the output that a person generates, what do we reward? Well, when we thought about this, somebody else might come up with something else. Um, we thought, uh, I think we reward how long people work, how hard people work, and the onerousness of the conditions under which people work, as long as they're doing something that's socially valued. That last phrase is very, very important. It sounds like a stick on or an add on, but it's not. <clears throat> if we reward how long, how hard and the onerousness, I could go back into my, I could go into my lawn if I had one and um, dig holes and fill them in and have my kids, you know, shoot the, the hose at me while I'm doing it. So the conditions are onerous and I work strenuously and I work long hours and I earn a fortune, but it's not, of anybody, it's nobody values it. It's not, it's not contributing to the social pie. So as long as we're contributing to the social pie, we get income for duration, intensity, and onerousness. That seems to me to be ethically sound. That seems to me uh, to be just, uh, to be what we mean when we use those words. Now, some people hopefully will, will take issue with that in the questions, but I, I do want to go on so we'll have plenty of time for, uh, for questions for these. Um, first of all, what's the implications of this? Well, the implications of this are that if tomorrow we turned, you know, we in the United States did this, those at the bottom, those earning the least income would most likely be earning the most, right? They, they tend to work the longest, they tend to work the hardest, and they tend to work under the worst conditions. Why is that? Because those three, as well as income, are affected greatly by bargaining power. Those on the bottom have the least bargaining power. So they not only get the least income, they get they work the longest and they work the hardest and they have the worst conditions. But if we change things so that uh, remuneration was for equitable, was for duration, intensity and onerousness, then those on the bottom would be earning the most. Uh, so it really would turn the world upside down. Now in a participatory economy, it wouldn't mean that because there wouldn't be anybody on the bottom we'd have balanced job complexes. And that would tend to make that situation much different. And more, but in a participatory economy, people would get remuneration for duration, intensity, and onerous. So if you work a little longer, because you want to get a brand new violin that's really very expensive because you play violin, right? So you decide you want to work a little longer, that's okay, right? It's okay to work a little longer or a little harder, or, or maybe you take up some of the onerous work that comes along by accident in your workplace or something. Or maybe you value leisure more, right? So you, you don't want more stuff. You've got enough stuff. You'd rather work less long, fine, right? In a participatory economy, you get to make that choice. Okay, so um, Thatcher re-enters the room. Uh, 
and says, once again, Michael, you're out of your mind. Uh, what's wrong with this? And I doubt that even Thatcher would say what's wrong with this, maybe I'm wrong about this, is that it's, it's not ethically sound. She, I don't think she would hone in on that. Nobody ever has. Um, she would in fact say it won't work. There is no alternative. There is no better alternative. There's no working alternative. It won't work. And here's why she would say that. We won't have any doctors, right? If it's the case that you can earn as much and you will earn as much, and maybe we'll even learn more, right? Um, in different jobs than like being a doctor, you won't be a doctor. Why would you go to school for all that time? Why would you, why would you, you know, endure the initial stages of doctoring when you when you're basically being uh, um, I can't remember the word rushed. I mean, it's like a fraternity, and you're being indoctrinated into being a doctor while you're a doctor. Um, and they, they call it something in the United States. Anyway, um, uh, you wouldn't endure all that. So what she would say is, the problem, Michael, is that your incentives are all off. Your incentives make no sense. You do not incentivize what society needs, and therefore society won't get it. And so once again, trying to be ethical and trying to create something wonderful, you're proposing something that will cause us to have no medicine, no doctoring, no, you know, it, we will lose uh, too much because people won't want to do these things. Uh, so my answer to that is uh, imagine that you're just about to get out of high school and you're now making a choice. And your choice is uh, maybe I'm going to go and uh, uh, work in a coal mine, or maybe I'm going to become a doctor. And so Thatcher is saying, uh, you opt for the coal mine because the incentives are warped and will cause you to opt for the coal mine instead of to pursue being a doctor. And I say that's not true. Uh, and for doctor, you can now put in lawyer, dentist, engineer, whatever, right? Um, coordinator class type job or a working class type job. And um, I say that's not true. First of all, we have balanced job complexes, but let's set that aside for a moment and see whether or not it really is the case, what we have to incentivize. And I've done this with uh, students who are in fact just graduating from college many times. And I've picked out even the ones that are going to medical school to raise their hands. And I say, okay, let's assume that um, when you become a doctor, you'll earn I don't know, $500,000 a year. And if you go into the coal mine, you'll earn $50,000 a year. Uh, you're telling me, Thatcher's telling me that you need the $500,000 salary in order to induce you to become the doctor. And I'm saying you get the $500,000 salary because you have the bargaining power to take it and you don't need the, indu the inducement. And so I say, I want you to think now, I'm going to start lowering the salary and you tell me when you would forego going to college because it's so onerous compared to being in a coal mine, going to medical school because it's so onerous compared to being in a coal mine and being a intern, you know, in a, the, the early doctor because it's so onerous and then being a doctor if as I start lowering the salary, and I do this with the people and I'll say 500,000, 400,000, 300,000, 200, nobody's changing. Nobody is saying, okay, I'll forgo being a doctor and I'll, I'll work in the coal mine or flipping hamburgers or whatever it is on the assembly line, et cetera. Um, nobody is saying it. And finally, somebody will raise their hands and say, and I, I'm down to 50,000 now. And somebody will raise his hand and say, or her hand and say, how low can I go and still survive? Because there's no way that I'm going into the coal mine uh, unless I can't survive and I have to go there. I'll be the doctor even for the low pay. And what it reveals is you don't need an incentive for people to do certain things. You need the incentive for people to exert themselves, right? For the duration and the, and the intensity 
and the onerousness that they're willing to endure. That's where you need the incentive. And so participatory economics, in fact, I think, not only delivers equity, where we define equity, this is a value, we're defining it. We're saying equity is you get remuneration uh, in accord with your duration, intensity, and onerousness of work. So if you don't get that, it's inequitable. If LeBron James is inequitable, um, getting less than that is inequitable, getting more than that is inequitable, et cetera. Um, and we're also saying that it delivers the uh, appropriate array of incentives. It incentivizes that which you can affect. If I give you more because you have luck in the genetic endowment, well, you can't, it doesn't matter how much I give you. You can't change what, you, what, you, what your talent, is, what your genes are, right? If I give you luck in more for luck in the, in the tool lottery, maybe you could go steal some tools, but um, uh, I, can, I can promote the use of good technology in ways other than enriching the people who actually are the beneficiaries of it. I don't have to do that. I can do it in other ways, we'll see. Um, and so there, there is no positive incentive effects of remunerating for property that causes people to want more property and to try and get it and to then try to maximize the income, the profits they get from it. Or power that causes people to try and accrue power to take more, that's not a good incentive effect. Uh, and even output uh, is, is not, it, it has one incentive effect that looks good on the face of it, training, right? But if we pay for training, if training is, is paid for and is a social good because it's in fact producing more skills and more knowledge and therefore it's work and you get paid to do it rather than paying paying others for it um, then you no longer need the incentive and uh, let me now finally add one last thing I don't know how many um, anarchists we have there is another view of, of remuneration uh, and the other view of remuneration is you should get um, uh, you should get for need and you should contribute for ability, right? So you, you work according to ability and you receive income according to need. And that's a longstanding, it's generally thought to be anarchist. It was actually first, I think Marx uttered it first, um, but it doesn't really matter what the lineage is. It's a popular view. Uh, so do I accept that? No, uh, I don't. I don't think that is good. Um, for, again, various reasons, and I'll just provide two. One reason is I should get for my need. Who gets to say what my need is? Well, anybody who, who advocates this will agree that certainly nobody else should be telling me what my needs are, right? It's only anti-authoritarians who, who advocate this. So they wouldn't be saying that. So I should determine my need. Okay, and if people get to their need, I'm being told that I can have what I need. Well, if I can have what I need, and it's not a bad thing to take what I need, then I want a yacht, right? I want a giant telescope in my backyard, because I like looking at the stars. I'd like a big organ, because I play the organ, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, and there's nothing wrong with it, because the norm is that I should get for my need. So there's a problem here. And if I can work to my ability, there's two problems on that side. One, I can say, I don't have any ability. I don't want to work, right? I could say that. Or alternatively, I could say, look, my ability is to play baseball shortstop and I want to be the shortstop of the Yankees. Um, and both are bad. One underproduces and the other one underproduces because what I would be doing would be worthless because I'm not good at shortstop. So on both sides, as, there's a problem. And finally, there's a problem uh, uh, with the economy not knowing what to do. Suppose we produce something, violins or, or bicycles, and we get back a communication that a lot of people want violins or bicycles. And this, this norm would give us that, right? People say what they want. Uh, so we would get that communication, but we would get no information about how much they want it. 
And if we have no information about how much we want, they wanted, we don't know whether it makes sense to produce. Does it make sense to use the steel and the rubber and my work time to produce it? Or is it frivolous, right? Do they want it just a tiny bit or because of some fad and it doesn't make sense? And could those things be used better for something else? It starts to move us toward questions of allocation. All right, but I'm gonna leave this so that um, I, I expect there'll be some questions. In summary, we rule out property income, we rule out uh, power income, we rule out output income because it leads to huge disparities because we are not all the same in all ways. Um, and we um, rule out uh, income for need, not for those who can't work. For those who can't work, we do have income for need, but for those who can work, we have income for duration, intensity, and onerousness of work. And uh, the, the virtue is that it's equitable uh, and the, um, it, it, it simultaneously incentivizes what should be incentivized, doing that which contributes to the social product within your ability to do so, within your power to do so. So allocation is um, the most complex aspect, I guess I would say, of economic life. The first three that we've done are complicated enough, but the fourth one is more so. Um, and allocation is basically, um, what's the process? What are the set of institutions and the process that, that permits or facilitates or forces the economy to arrive at the inputs and outputs, the stuff that's produced and the stuff that's consumed, stuff that's used in the process um, for the whole society. Uh, and, and, and where does it go? And, and that's what we mean by the term allocation. The existing options for allocation, before we start talking about something that we, we might like, are basically markets and central planning. Uh, markets, um, I'd like to be able to presume that everybody knows what markets are, but I'm not sure. A lot of people feel that markets are the place where you go to get stuff. And there's a reason why that's called a market. It's because any sane economy is going to have that. And so if you call that the mall markets, right? you have already legitimated markets as inevitable, right? You have made it seem as if markets are something that is just the way it is. And that's very useful, right? Because then there's no discussion about, well, wait a minute, does markets in fact, are they a good thing? So markets is basically a allocation mechanism in which actors um, exchange, they buy and sell and they compete and in the process of buying and selling and competing, they determine the relative valuation of things, prices, and they determine the outcomes. And central planning is a system in which instead of that, uh, central planners uh, um, basically ask the population for some information, receive it, send down a plan, uh, and ask for some response and receive that and send down a plan and now they receive obedience. Uh, people carry out the plan that the central planners um, uh, establish. And so those are the two predominant systems. It's often described as if, well, central planning is something that happens in you know, horrible countries that call themselves socialists and markets happen in wonderful companies that call, countries that call themselves capitalists. There's a problem with that, which is that most corporations in the United States use central planning internally. Um, and some of those corporations are larger than in terms of their economy, uh, whole countries. Um, so, uh, you, you know, you, uh, Amazon uh, doesn't have internal markets. The components of Amazon don't compete with each other uh, and set internal prices, which then govern the choices of all the people at Amazon. Rather, Amazon has central planning. It has Bezos and however many other people it has uh, creating plans. Now they consult to a degree, very limited, 
um, with their workforce to try and find out what they can get away with, but then they impose their central plan. So central planning is not necessarily only socialist and markets are not necessarily only capitalist. Yugoslavia had markets and no, uh, no capitalist owners. So these, these are tools, these are allocation systems which can be employed in different situations, okay. So I think both central planning and markets are disgusting. I think they are horrible, why? Well, first of all, they immediately violate um, uh, self-management. They immediately violate remuneration for duration, intensity, and onerousness of work. I'm not gonna go over everything again, but we can when we get to questions. I wanna leave time, you know. Um, uh, they, they violate those things. Uh, but I do want to discuss the, the third thing, which is that they, they do impose class division. So with central planning, it's much easier to see. <clears throat> the central planners are clearly above the rest in some sense. They're making um, crucial decisions that affect people's lives, et cetera, et cetera. But the central planners have to communicate with the rest of the economy. And the central planners, the last thing they want to do is communicate with a workers' council in which the workers have balanced job complexes and therefore are empowered, confident, and know what the hell they want. Central planners aren't interested in that. Central planners want to consume, you know, consult with and communicate with and deliver instructions to a set of people in the workplace who will oversee the implementation of those of those proposals or of those instructions, right? So they want a layer of, of power inside the workplaces, sort of like the United States wanting a layer of compliant power inside countries. Um, sorry. Um, the, so, so what we have is the emergence of the coordinator class. Uh, once again, why? it goes further than just the people inside the workplaces who are exerting power. What's the justification for all these people having power? Well, it's knowledge. It's a monopoly of information and skills and so on. And so you have to, you have to also respect that in other people like doctors or lawyers, right? You can't denigrate the basis, what justifies your power and your high income in others. So what happens is uh, in this kind of situation, you have again, the coordinator class working class distinction. And you have, uh, this might be controversial for some, but you have uh, the Bolsheviks destroying uh, uh, the workers councils, uh, or the Soviets. Um, not an accident of history, not a, um, a, a fundamental problem of bad apples in the leadership, a natural outcome of the whole process. Um, okay, what about uh, markets? Markets is more subtle. Um, suppose we, suppose we um, take over companies like in Argentina, we set up workers and consumers councils, we institute balanced job complexes, we have self-managing decision-making inside all these units, right? And now we connect everything with markets, right? So the, the units are corrected with markets and the units are connected to the consumers with markets and so on. And what happens? Well, we can look at history of Yugoslavia and I think get some indication of what happens that way, or we can just think about it. Um, some things can be thought about. I, th I think this is one. Um, what happens I think is something like this, um, giving it too short shrift again. Consider we're, we're such a workplace. We, we manufacture bicycles and we have our balanced job complexes and we have our equitable incomes and we have our self-managed workers council, but we're operating on the market. And because we're operating on the market, we have to compete for market share. And that has certain implications. Uh, as we sit around in our council and decide whether or not to institute daycare, a lot of us will say yes, but some of us will say, hold on just a minute. I heard that the bicycle factory over on the other side of town is not instituting daycare. They don't want to take that amount of time away from their production of bicycles. And, and if we institute it, they're going to outcompete us. 
And when they outcompete us, eventually we're going to go out of business. And so we'll be sitting here with our balanced job complexes and equitable remuneration and full self-management and no income, right? We'll be starving. So this is sort of Thatcher. We'll, we'll be starving and that's no good. And so what do we have to do? And now somebody says, well, I guess we can't have daycare. But it goes further than that. We have to use speed up. We have to dump our pollution. We have to do various things that make us better able to generate bicycles and advertisements about bicycles, right? In order to increase our share of the market. And none of us want to do that, right? None of us want to do that. We don't want to hurt ourselves. And so what do we do? Well, I think we go to the place that trains people to do that. We go to the Harvard Business School or the uh, London School of Economics or whatever, and we look for people to employ whose education and socialization and conception is such that they will be okay with making decisions that hurt us in the workplace, as long as we bring them in and we don't make them subject to the decisions. So we give them air conditioned offices, we give them nice surroundings, we give them reasonable circumstances, we give them higher pay, and then we say, okay, fuck us, so that we can compete with the other firms that are doing this. And so markets have a tendency to reintroduce and a much earlier question was driving at this, I think. Markets have a tendency to reintroduce the coordinator class working class distinction. Okay, so if we rule out central planning and markets, what the hell do we do? You, you can see that, I mean, the, the whole presentation and the whole thinking about vision, this is the way it sort of, I think, has to work. You take it a step at a time, you, you, you find things you're committed to, and then the implications of those things have further further implications for other aspects of what it is that you're trying to generate. So now we have this problem that we have to, um, we have to come up with a new mode of allocation. And I, I think we immediately see certain things. We have workers and consumers councils and we have self-management. So that means workers and consumers councils will have to be involved in the determination of inputs and outputs of, of allocation they will have to be participating in the allocation process. So in some sense, allocation has to be a process in which workers and consumers councils are communicating with one another and in, in some, right? And are moving toward a plan. So it's a kind of a decentralized planning. Uh, we call it participatory planning. And then you have to have um, um, clarity about how that happens. What is it, what is it um, that causes the rounds of decentralized planning in which workers and consumers councils are making proposals and then are hearing each other's proposals and then are refining their proposals in light of the feedback with an eye on what? On income, on well-being, on their fulfillment, et cetera. Why does it come to a conclusion? And does it take everything into account? What does it have to take into account? Well, when we value something, we have to take into account the full social, ecological, and uh, uh, personal implications. So <clears throat> if bicycles involve the pollution, that has to be taken into account. If it's not taken into account, then our allocation system is not functioning properly, right? Because it's it's valuing bicycles without noticing that there's a debit of pollution. So it has to take that into account. So we need an allocation system that does that. Markets don't, central planning can to a degree, but doesn't bother because it's not in the coordinator class's interests often. Uh, we need an allocation system that takes that into account. We need an allocation system which um, uh, uh, delivers to the participants uh, a degree of self-managing say. So it has to deliver to consumers and producers, workers and consumers, a, a degree of say that is 
not perfectly, there's no such thing, but in accord with the degree to which they're affected uh, by the decisions, by the, by the outcomes of the allocation system. So we need to deliver that. And we need to deliver um, an allocation system which doesn't create a class division, then disrupting everything that we believe in. And if we can deliver an allocation system like that, and I think we can, and I think it is called participatory planning, and you know, and we could go into much more detail here, but there are more panels, or I don't know what you're calling these, but there are more sessions, and I think a couple of them are, are dealing with it. Um, and I'll try and answer questions also if they arise. And, uh, uh, but so participatory economics is not all that complicated when you get right down to it. It's workers and consumers self-managing councils. It's balanced job complexes, it's equitable remuneration, and it's participatory planning. Is that a whole economy? No. On top of that, there will be all kinds of features that emerge from the practical experience that we gain as we fight for and then institute a new kind of economy. Um, you know, capitalism isn't just private ownership and uh, banks and wage slavery. Um, it's, it's more than that in any given country and it's different in different countries. So participatory economics will have more features, but what makes it participatory economics, I think is those four things. Um, and, and I guess you could add in as a fifth thing, although it's implicit, the, the fact that there's no private ownership of the means of production. Uh, so Michael, what do you think are the strongest criticisms of Paracon, and what's your response? Um, Self-management reduces the quality of decisions. Uh, balanced job complexes reduces the quality of output by workers. Uh, remuneration uh, uh, fucks up the incentive system. And allocation, um, well, we haven't, I, I actually didn't give those. Um, there are various ones. The, the main one is people say, it'll take too long and uh, you know, it's just impossible. Um, so that's a one there. So those are, those are the most common criticisms that I encounter. It's sort of interesting. I've given talks all over the place and it's interesting that the, the discussions are almost the same every place. Um, it doesn't matter where, you know, so um, Turkey or New York, it makes no difference. You get the same kinds of, of discussions ensuing. Uh, and I, I, I answered my, my responses to those criticisms. If somebody wants to pursue one of them further, let's do that instead of my going on and on with what I already went on with. Yeah, Michael, I do not really understand. Um, on the one side, you bring this really good arguments against markets that you can't live in a market society if you want to live well and emancipatory, et cetera, et cetera. And so I understand you stuck to money because of the remun uh, sorry, remuneration <laughs> side, salary side. Um, <clears throat> and you're bashing the needs and ability approach, which from far what I know, for example, had been mentioned uh, while being tortured by Thomas Münzer, 1525. Um, for the first time, or maybe not for the, probably not for the first time, but for the first time recorded, maybe. Um, what might have to do with the fact that people had been quite used in the villages also to the commons approach, and um, the commons approach would be an approach to have a system according to me. And, um, with to stuck to money on the remuneration side, the problem is that you have structurally differences between productive and reproductive work. And okay. um, also among ourselves, uh, the camera, it's not so obvious, but if you look into the participants, I had a quick look, I had the impression two thirds, uh, uh, I would read the names as males. Um, and there's this, I would really call it a lack of theorizing of reproduction um, in what I know from 
uh, your work. Although already in the 70s, there have been, since then you have a strong feminist current that says you cannot, um, you can, as far as I know, or what I read from you is that you say either you treat it as private or you include it into the salary work just as other kind of work. Mm. But if it is private, you have all the problems you have in this capitalist system with this way of solution as well, that uh, this work is not paid, although it is hard work often. And uh, so maybe we agree that this is not the solution. But if you include it, you have the structural difference between that productive work is much more profitable because you can streamline it much better and reproduction work is not. Okay. And also if you have, for example, uh, yeah, think, think of an intentional community, uh, one person brings the kid to bed and this might take two hours because it doesn't go to bed and the other person is doing some uh, other work maybe in the workshop or whatever and this will lead to a comparison because this is what a salary is for that you have this comparison then the question is why do you need to take so long for, to bring the kid into the bed but the logic with care work is absolutely different spending time is the logic and not rationalizing time so you cannot you cannot compare it uh, in this terms. And even if people then say, uh, yeah, what contributes more to our wealth and our well being, you have this uh, imbalances. So you have feminists. I just read two days ago this book, it's just the news of a feminist. She's very well known because she co founded um, Care Revolution in Germany, Gabriele Winka. She also says, again, as many theories feminist economist before her, um, we have to get rid of okay. money and have to get rid of the division between paid and non-paid labor. There's many questions in there, and so I'll, I'll do the best I can. Uh, uh, it started with, and it actually ended with money. Um, money is just a, a, a numeric indicator of uh, values or valuations of stuff. Uh, and if we're going to be able to make judgments, sensible judgments about how much of things we want, it's, uh, it's valuable for that. And, and what we're, what we're, uh, what we're, what's responsible, right? If I know my income, if I know my budget, I know what it's responsible for me to consume. Uh, and if I'm a producer and I know how much people want things, I know what it's responsible for me to try and produce. But that wasn't the heart of what you were asking, so I want to move on to that. Um, there's two or three lines of thought among participatory advocates uh, having to do with, I think, the issues that we raise. Um, so the problem uh, that's pointed to is uh, there's actually two of them. One is household labor, let's call it, whatever its characteristics may be, and labor outside the household. So that's one problem. Uh, another problem is caring labor, and that doesn't have to be in the household, and other kinds of labor. Uh, so let's, uh, let's do the latter one first, because a, a, a prominent proposal among advocates of participation now is something like the following. Caring work, like empowering work, has some very important attributes. It causes the person doing it to have a greater degree of empathy and of comprehension of other people's lives. And the absence of caring work uh, sort of diminishes that. And so one proposal is that in the same way we balance jobs for empowerment, maybe there ought to be a degree of, of balancing for caring work. That is um, everybody, uh, and certainly not just women, but everybody um, has as a part of their overall work balance, a degree of caring. Now, one response I have to that is that it's good. And obviously the sentiment is good, 
But another response that I have to that is actually that all work should be caring work. That is to say, okay, it's not the same um, making a bicycle as uh, caring for somebody who's in a sick bed. I agree. But it ought to be the case that making the bicycle is not entirely about my well-being. It's also about the well-being of the bicycle people, of the people who get the bicycle. So there should be a component of caring in everything. Um, there isn't now, of course. There can't be. Nobody even knows what, what they produce, where it goes. Anyway, that's one line of thought. The household versus non-household work. Um, here, there's, there's some disagreement. I, you know, I'm not entirely sure, but I'll speak for myself. I honestly don't like calling what goes on in the household work in the same way with the same meaning that we use that term to describe what goes on in the bicycle factory or any other external workplace for two reasons. I think it demeans what goes on in the household. Household involves, it isn't even just caring, it is having and nurturing and uh, the next generation. Um, as well as one another. And I think there's something that goes well beyond what goes on in the workplace in that. And uh, so I'm not sure I like the idea of the same term, but there's another sense um, uh, that, that it troubles me. And that is that work in a participatory economy is done in workers' councils. And it is um, mediated by the planning process. And I don't think that household work should require people in the household to be in some kind of, I don't know what you'd call it, nurturance council or, you know, the industry. It just doesn't make much sense to me. Now, now arises a problem that you raise. Well, but if you say that, <clears throat> then you're consigning that stuff to the private realm and it'll still be all screwed up it'll still be sexist and, and have other faults also. And my answer to that is, and this I find to be sort of an irony or a, a strange situation. There are, there are many feminists who rightly critiqued uh, Marxism and economism, right? As trying to subsume everything under the economy. But suddenly on this issue, they seem to feel sometimes that the only way there can be real and liberating change is by an economic revolution or a political revolution. I don't understand why the well-being of men, women, and children, and children I think is a big part of this, in living units, right, um, isn't a part of a revolution call it in the kinship realm, whatever you want to call it, so that saying it's left to private makes it sound like it's left to the way things are now there. It's as if somebody said, we should have a feminist revolution for families and, and sexuality and, and interaction and child rearing. And um, so maybe we should treat the workplace as if it's a family because otherwise it won't change. See what I'm saying? In other words, the workplace is gonna change and consumption is gonna change if it does because there's an economic revolution. And it will be connected with and made compatible with, and it needs to do that, a revolution that occurs in the relations of men and women and gender and kinship and sexuality. Uh, but that realm, that realm's transformation shouldn't depend on economic vision. It should come from its own vision, right? Same for culture, same for polity. They, they have to be compatible with each other. You can't have you know, two main spheres of social life next to each other that are simply incompatible. That would be a chaos. So I agree. So now different people will say different things about this. I, I, that's sort of, in a nutshell, I guess, which isn't fair to me in some ways, what I think. Um, we'll, we'll see how things unfold. Uh, that's going to be the answer to most real questions, ultimately. 
it's not for us to decide. Uh, could we, could we, in a participatory economy, <clears throat> remunerate household labor? Yes. Could we um, remunerate uh, child rearing? Yes. Um, <clears throat> is it possible? Yes. I'm saying I don't think it's the best solution. Um, I think it's, um, there are better solutions to achieving the feminist outcome, to achieving, you know, the sexually liberated outcome and to achieving the economic outcome uh, than doing that. Because, look, if, if you make household labor, labor that's remunerated for duration, intensity and onerousness, but it's not in a workers council, um, then the person who, as you pointed out, likes a a more carefully and frequently updated layout of their house, right, would be working more in that realm. But they are the beneficiary. They are largely the beneficiary. So where I said work had to be contributing to the social product, some things you do in the household contribute by virtue of creating the next generation to everybody. But some things you do in the household contribute to your, you know, are, are in accord with your desires for your household and don't have much to do with outside. So that's another problem. Anyway, I'm gonna stop there. Next question is, I agree. It all boils down to how to organize the allocation system. Even if the principles by which the allocation happens is decided in a participatory way by society, there will be someone who presses the button, someone who is physically responsible for the allocation and how does one prevent this, these people become again the higher class? Okay, um, let me have two responses to that. First of all, I don't think it all boils down to the allocation system. I think rather, um, and that's why I described in terms of these four things, I think each of these four things is fundamental and definitional and missing on any of them can have profound implications for the capacity to do the others, okay? but. Regarding allocation, no. In participatory economy, there is nobody who presses the button. There is no center. There is nobody who is in position, I would argue, to aggrandize themselves. In other words, what I'm saying, a central planner can adapt the central plan to benefit him or herself and people like him or herself. That's true. And there is nothing there that... Um, that obstructs that and it is a natural uh, tendency of, of the system. And in you know, markets with capitalists, it's a natural tendency of the system for the, for the capitalists to do so and in markets with the coordinator class for the coordinator class to do so. In participatory economics, there's no such situation. Remu your income is a function of duration, intensity and onerousness. That's the only way that I can increase my income that isn't due to the entire production of society growing and everybody's income being increased. There's just no other avenue. And in fact, if I try to find another avenue, because there is actually, I can steal, right? I can physically steal stuff. Or more interestingly, let's say I'm, uh, I'm Roger Federer. Maybe there's somebody here from Sweden. So I'm Roger Federer. He would never do this, but I'm Roger Federer and I'm the world's best or nearly the world's best tennis player. And what am I doing? In a participatory economy, I have a balanced job complex. I'm playing tennis, but I'm also doing some other stuff. And my income is for duration, intensity, and onerousness. I'm not earning you know, a thousand times what other people earn, or even 10 times what other people earn. And only if I work really a lot am I earning more than the average and so on. However, I want more. And I am, after all, the best tennis player in the world. So I decide that I'll create a black market. I decide that I'll sell tennis lessons. I will let people have get tennis lessons from me. And that's a valuable thing. We, we shouldn't make believe it isn't. So a lot of people will really want those tennis lessons. And so I calculate, this is my way to make more income, right? I will sell tennis lessons. Well, I have a few problems. I need electricity, I need tennis courts, I need tennis balls, I need a place to do it. That's my first set of problems. Uh, the second set of problems, supposing I can get around all that somehow, 
um, I've saved up enough so that I have a tennis court and I, I invite these people over and they play in my backyard. Now they have to pay me. What do they pay me with, right? None of them are well are rich. So when they pay me, they're giving of their, let's say, average income. Okay, so let's say they want to do that. Um, how do they pay me? Well, if they pay me in cash, so to speak, we get to your money problem. If they pay me in money and I pile it up in my wallet and then I go to spend it, I am now spending more than it is possible for anybody to have unless they are a thief, right? It's very hard for me to hide the fact that I was a thief to get all this income. So what do they do? And they can't really transfer their, their, their income in any case because their income is for their share of the social product and it's not fungible, they can't share it. So what do they do? I tell them I want some chicken and they bring me a chicken. I tell them I want, and now we make it something more valuable. I, I want a new big TV and a bunch of them get together and they get me a new big. Now, if this stuff is accumulating, unlike in market socialism and unlike in centrally planned socialism, market coordinatorism and centrally planned coordinatorism, neither one of socialism, I think, um, I can't display all that stuff. If I display all that stuff, everybody knows that I cheated. There's no such thing as such a giant disparate income. So I can't, so I have to put it in my basement. So what we have is an economy where I, I, it's very hard to cheat. And if I cheat, I have to en enjoy it entirely in private. And of course, in doing it, I am risking my reputation and maybe even punishment, right? Um, so in any case, that, that's something, for instance, that was built into participatory economics that when Robin and I were thinking about it, it never crossed our minds. And there it was. Theft and cheating and stealing turns out to be very difficult. Why? Because it's a fucking equitable economy, you know, because it's fair, because it's got self, because it has these attributes. And so it's not easy to, as compared to our economy in which, you know, if you steal, so you have more money, everybody, you know, that's not uncommon. There's, that doesn't display that you cheated, that displays that you did well, end quote. Yeah. All right, you get the idea. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's kind of sad that you talk that long that we don't have a lot of time to discuss, but that's how it is now. And we don't know about the allocation system. It's also, but um, because I would want to talk about your feminist critic or something, because feminist critic, it's about getting rid of the vision of spheres. It's not about integrating care into economy, but to make organized economy as care. That's and, what I said. Uh, whatever. But um, I want to make another point. There was already a society that got rid of competition on the base of wage labor, and it was real socialism. They did central planning. That's true. And there were some problems with it. And I think you can't do it on decentral planning, but still you have very much the same logics in place that you have in market societies. That's why I would call it state capitalism. They, you, you get rid of um, the price, they got rid of price differences between the different products. I think you still have price difference in your, your model as long as I remember. Without the price difference, there's no competition and there's no incentive to produce well other than the people really want to do it. But why should they? They are paid to do the stuff. They don't want to be there usually. Like in real socialism, it, and also they, they didn't want to do the things. And on a need and ability approach, people would be there to do the things and they would like to do these things. You don't need competition to press them to do it. And that's what the real socialists realize. They say, <laughs> oh shit, we need competition to do people, uh, do the things good. That's what, what was their final answer to it. And they go back to capitalism and always, yeah, the rest is history. But also uh, without competition, in, in a society based on wage labor, as an enterprise, we produce bicycles. It still makes sense to us to fuck ourselves up, to um, speed up um, the production, to destroy the environment, to reduce the cost of it, and all this kind of stuff. It's still all in place. Logic of externalization, the logic of exclusion, it's still all in place, and you still have all the major things that link state socialism and capitalism. You have prices, you have money, you have wage labor, you have remuneration, you even have property. 
yeah like you still have all in place i think your thing is just a mix between it's a little bit between market socialism and state so like market socialism state socialism right, me, that answer. big thing my answer is we don't have all those things okay we we don't have the things that you say wage slavery is a system in which you sell your ability to do work right and uh then the person who buys your ability to do work uh, tries to extract as much labor as they can that's the definition of it that comes from marx and it's valid and it's real and the thing called wage slavery exists it's not slavery you're not selling yourself or somebody else isn't capturing you and selling you, right? It's your time and your ability to do work. That doesn't exist in participatory economics. When you, when you go get a job at a firm, right? You're not getting a job from somebody who is uh, owning the firm or even from a group which is profiting from the firm. You are joining a collective of workers and all of you are controlling the firm. And your income, like theirs, and everybody's, nobody's income is, any, is determined in any other way, is a function of uh, duration, intensity, and onerousness of socially valued labor. That applies to everyone equally. Uh, everybody has that. So when you say we have prices, what you're saying is we have valuations of things. We know that there's a difference, be yes, and that's true. We know that there's a difference between, um, say, one ear of corn and 10, or one ear of corn and a bicycle, or a violin and a grand piano, or et cetera, et cetera. And what we know is that these things, right, um, they, they have a different uh, mix of components, and that in order to track and to pay attention to how we are using those components, our ability to work, our labor, and also steel and coal and, and wood and whatever, uh, uh, you know, uh, in order to be able to track, to track how we're using those things and to use them responsibly and well in light of people's needs and desires, we have to uh, pay attention to that. The, I, I would urge you, please, and I would be more than happy to continue with it. Uh, I don't know whether you know the podcast Revolution Z that I do. It's a podcast. If you go to Znet, you'll see links for it. The most three recent editions, uh, not episodes, right, are dealing with anarchist criticisms, okay? And so at length, um, dealing with the kinds of concerns that you're raising, which are all perfectly legitimate concerns. It's just that they are that they characterize the system differently than it is. It's like saying, I mean, this would be a stark example. And some anarchists say this, workplaces produce pollution, workplaces oppress, workplaces are exploitative. And all of which is true right now. And in fact, producing pollution will always be true. So all of that is true right now. And then the anarchists said, let's get rid of workplaces. Okay, now some say that, they're crazy um, because you don't get rid of workplaces. You replace the bad with something good that accomplishes the needed functions in a desirable way. So you get rid of wage slavery. You get rid of prices that are determined by bargaining power. You get rid of prices that are determined by competition. You get rid of uh, uh, budgets that are imposed by bargaining power. You get rid of all that crap. But then you have to deal with the fact that in a complex society, you have to allocate stuff in accord with human needs and potentials. And to do that, you need something. And the something that you need is an allocation system that is compatible with classlessness and all the rest of what we've talked about. And I can't do it as quick as it would be needed, but that's what is trying to be done. The notion that what accomplishes that is to just say, we should work to our ability and we should get for our need. What's wrong with that isn't the sentiment, right? I'm not challenging the sentiment behind it. I'm challenging that it doesn't, it won't work. It can't work. It can't even remotely work because it doesn't deliver information that we need, right? 
information that we need. But really, that's so easy. We have loads of possibility to communicate in the information and people are also, that's, that's not a problem to communicate needs and discuss them. And what is more important, producing yachts and telescopes or basic Medicare for all and food and clothing. It's just, yeah, it's that's fine. not a difficult discussion to do in a free society. Like yeah, really yeah. You make people really stupid and egoistic and the need and if you if, criticize the need and mobility approach. Okay, we, we can agree to disagree. Um, I think that it is in fact difficult, not difficult, it is possible, this system can do it, right, to recognize the ecological effects of production, the social effects of production, and the individual effects of production and consumption, and to then make choices that take all that into account in a way that is in accord with people managing their own lives. I think that's not so easy, uh, not impossible, but it's not easy. Markets don't do it, central planning doesn't do it. I think participatory planning does do it or can do it. You disagree, you think that it can be done really quite simply, right? We don't need to keep track of relative valuations. We don't need um, to keep track of budgets. What we need to do is be responsible. And what I'm telling you is being responsible requires that kind of information. But let's go on. Um, in the line of everything should be caring. Michael, I hear it in your answer even. You say the bike should be uh, productive in a way as well that people care for, that they have the possibility to care for what they do, that they live in resonance with their environment and with the products they produce and mm -hmm. can do this without competition. And I don't see that you can have a remuneration system that does not put people in competition to each other, even if you have, even if you avoid the market in the whole. And one more point that makes it prob problematic to pay people um, or to have any extrinsic motivation is this crowding, crowding out of motivations, which where you have many experiments with very small children and with grown up people that show that the intrinsic motivation is killed by an extrinsic uh, remuneration like money or gummy beers or whatever. People who help stop when they do it, they do it, but then if you give them something for it and then you stop it, then they will stop helping and everything. These two little kids and these two grown up people. So you can't just add money to a good system. It destroys a lot. If money is a measure of bargaining power, it's disaster. If money doesn't, if money, money isn't the issue, it's prices. If prices don't uh, take account of the human effects of production and consumption, then they're a disaster. If prices don't take account of the ecological impact of choices, then they're a disaster. They're incomplete. And, you, and the decisions made based upon them are, are off from what they ought to be. Um, so we agree about that much. I, I, don't, I don't understand the, the idea, or I, I'm not sure what you're saying, so it's hard to reply. But I think I heard that, that somehow um, it's either motivation or something requires competition. And I don't know what that is. I'm not against competition per se. If you and I play a game of chess and we're each trying to win, I suppose we're competing, right? Um, I'm a, a, against rewarding competition, remunerating it. Uh, just because you win the game of chess, you don't get more income. You get income for duration, intensity, and onerousness. Um, uh, so I'm against remunerating competition. Sometimes competition is okay. Most of the time it's horrible. In the allocation system, it is horrible. It leads to horrible outcomes. But there's nothing about my getting income for how long, how hard, and the owners and the conditions under which I work. That doesn't cause me to compete with anyone. I don't get better off if somebody else gets worse off. No such dynamic exists in participatory economy. There's no way to get ahead at somebody else's disadvantage or vice versa. That we're not, we're not sort of competing for a bigger share of something. That's not, it doesn't exist. It's not in the system. So I'm not sure what it means. Now you could say that 
well, for example, there are some people who say the following. Uh, if you can't shoot for the moon, in other words, if you can't compete to get really way ahead, then there'll be no motivation to do anything, right? Uh, without the possibility of competing and a grant, you know, making big gains, we won't be motivated. Okay, I just think that's nonsense, all right? I mean, there's, there's no evidence for that at all. First of all, 90% of society has no possibility of big gain at all, and most of them work harder than the other 10%. So it's, you know, the observation is down the drain already. But um, when we make it the case that the economy is such that for me to get together to, to, to do better, even if I'm a malignant soul, even if I care only about myself, right, for whatever fucked up reason, I have no social empathy whatsoever. So I'm a narcissist, right? If we make the economy such that for me to improve my situation, I have to improve other people's situation. There's no avenue to it, except that I have to improve other people's situation. Then that's a good economy. And that's participatory economics. That's the way it's structured. That's right? why I contribute. You said we should revolutionize the family system as well. Well, I live for 20 years in big communities and it would feel absolutely absurd to pay some part of my uh, some part of the work and not the other work or to pay it all it would co completely destroy everything the whole fun of doing things and contributing to the well-being of everybody I, I i wish there was more time i'm not i'm not sure i'm following you but yes if 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 people can compete to get a job which remunerates a lot more that's going to be a very negative dynamic. I agree, but that doesn't exist in participatory economics. It just doesn't exist. Every job, every, every worker is getting an income um, because of duration, intensity, and onerousness of their work. Every job has the same criteria. And there's only so much harder you can work Or so, or, or so many more hours. And in any case, it's ethical when you get more for that. It's not some kind of violation that you're competing for. It's okay because it only, you can only get it if it's socially responsible work. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, all of us, all of you. Um, time's over. There is, I, I see the need <laughs> of a more discussion, more time. <laughs> just say something about that. I'm yeah. more than happy, more than happy to receive emails and to pursue further discussion through email. And the other thing is, there's tons more about participatory economics, questions and answers, dealing with concerns that people have, presenting it in a more formal way, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm happy to offer references to anybody who might want one or whatever. Um, there is also this, this book Michael wrote, is also available in German. Robin Hanel wrote, uh, some texts and books about Paracon, so there are quite uh, a few sources uh, to get information. Um, finally, again, thank you, Michael, for coming. And thank you for having me. Uh, I really appreciate it. So <laughs> bye bye and see you, see you later or tomorrow, wherever. <laughs>